Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, and thank you, everybody, for joining us on a rainy pre-hurricane morning. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for what I think is a very important discussion. My name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president of the United States Institute of Peace. And um, for those of you who are not familiar with us, USIP is an independent federal institute that was founded by Congress for the express purpose to develop practical approaches to preventing, mitigating, and recovering from violent conflict. And so we work in conflict zones around the world, uh, connecting our field programs with research, with training, uh, and with policy recommendations. And we know, as many of you do, that conflict is inevitable, but violence is not. So it's when violence occurs that lives are lost, and that development gains are overturned. So the big vision is a world without violent conflict. And of course, we're all of us here because we're all in the business of big visions. And that holds especially true for today's speaker. So I'm uh, just delighted that we're joined here today by Dr. Jim Kim, who has been harnessing big ideas and building visions throughout his career as he's driven forward solutions, catalyzed change, and pushed for global collaboration. Um, trained as a physician and an anthropologist, which I think is a phenomenal combination, uh, Dr. Kim has dedicated his career to international development, he helping to improve the lives of underserved populations worldwide. He was president of Dartmouth, uh, co-founder of Partners in Health and a former director of the HIV AIDS Department of the World Health Organization. So throughout that pathway, Dr. Kim has brought renewed purpose and focus wherever he's worked. And under Jim Kim's leadership, the World Bank is really leading the charge on ending extreme poverty. And in his uh, established goals, he's committed the World Bank Group to end extreme poverty by 2030. While um, also boosting what he describes as shared prosperity. So I'm especially pleased to have Dr. Kim here today. As we saw last week, the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals um, at the UN Gen General Assembly. And these goals set out a very ambitious new pathway for the next 15 years, including the historic inclusion of my favorite goal, Goal 16, which calls for uh, inclusive, accountable, and participatory governance with equal justice for access. And coming up, of course, are the World Bank's fall meetings. So we're at this critical moment where the development enterprise is really having this important conversation about how do we reboot for the challenges ahead. I also just want to note that I had the opportunity to see Dr. Kim uh, in action as the Ebola outbreak in West Africa escalated into a truly terrible global crisis. And Dr. Kim stepped up uh, to help us forge this collective understanding of what was the most effective strategy and most importantly, a sense of joint global purpose, which was absolutely essential uh, for the kind of urgent action that was needed to combat that virus. This is the kind of urgent action we need to bring to the challenges for the next 15 years in the development world. So I very much look forward to the conversation about how the World Bank is continuing to do this and how we as a global community should come together. And here to have that conversation with us, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jim Kim. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Nancy, President Lindborg, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You know, when I was at the university, rain usually meant uh, we lost about 80% of our audience, so I'm really grateful uh, to all of you uh, for, for being here today. Uh, I'm especially grateful to be speaking today at the United States Institute uh, uh, of Peace, whose core principles uh, begin with the pledge to bring peaceful solutions to the world's problems. Today, the world's problems seem daunting indeed. Economic growth is slowing. Many countries remain locked in war. The number of extreme weather events continues to rise. And every day we see, by the tens of thousands, the anguish of families who've lost everything, in some cases risking their lives to cross from the Middle East and Africa uh, into Europe. With all these global threats and daily tragedies, it can be hard to imagine a world in which prosperity is shared by all. 
When we look at it all together, slowing growth, climate havoc, pandemic threats, families escape and conflict or poverty, it forces us to rethink fundamentally the development enterprise. But I know that we can succeed in achieving the twin goals of the World Bank Group, to end extreme poverty by 2030 and to boost shared prosperity for the bottom 40 percent of the population in developing countries. In the face of all the shocks and crises I mentioned, the World Bank Group focuses on the extreme poor and the bottom 40 percent because they are the most affected and the least able to recover. Over the last few years, a related discussion on inequality has taken hold, partly as a result of the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. Last year, Oxfam laid down an unusually sharp challenge in its report, Even It Up, stating that the richest 85 people in the world control as much wealth as the bottom 50 percent of the world, more than 3.5 billion people. By highlighting the stark reality that so much of the world's population shares almost none of the world's wealth, Oxfam touched a nerve. The World Bank Group's approach to addressing this problem is embodied in a term that suggests a solution, boosting shared prosperity. In our work with governments, we support efforts to ensure that everyone benefits from growth, not just those who already control or have access to capital. We know that to boost shared prosperity, the incomes of the, four, the, the, the poorest 40 percent must grow, ideally at a rate that matches or exceeds the rate of income growth for the general population. But since 1990, labor income in most countries has grown more slowly than national GDP. More recently, inequality has increased in the United States, as well as much of Europe, China, Indonesia, and AS, India and Indonesia, about half the world's population. But the news isn't all bad. Of 94 countries in our global shared prosperity database, 65 of them, which comprises about 73 percent of the global population, have enjoyed mean income growth for the poorest 40 percent between 2000 and 2007 and 2012, despite the financial crisis during that time. And in 56 of the 94 countries, growth in the bottom 40 percent has been faster than for the population as a whole. So the poorest people have not always been left behind. We know that people will earn higher wages when markets are more efficient for everyone and governments provide better access to quality health services and education. More income for more people increases demand and consumption, leading to still more investment, both public and private. For us then, to reach our twin goals, three things have to happen. Inclusive economic growth, investment in human beings, and insurance against the risk that people could fall back into poverty. Grow, invest, insure. That's our shorthand for the strategy. Of the three, economic growth accompanied by rising wages and job creation has been the most important factor in reducing extreme poverty over the past half century. But we're not focusing simply on growth of GDP. We reject trickle-down notions that assume that any undifferentiated growth permeates and fortifies the soil and everything starts to bloom, even for the poor. We need to find an economic growth model that lifts up the poorest citizens rather than enriching only those at the top. But what do we do in an era of low global growth such as we're living through right now? One answer is to encourage and help all countries to do what they can to boost growth, which often means tough measures like uh, 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 and, and, excuse me, which often means tough measures and reforms like ending regressive fossil fuel subsidies, improving the business climate, and making public expenditures more efficient and targeted. Developing countries must also construct more equitable, efficient, and transparent tax collection systems. IMF Managing Director Christine Lagarde and I pledged a few months ago that our organizations will do everything we can to help countries collect more taxes more fairly. In too many countries, the rich evade paying their fair share. Some companies use elaborate strategies to not pay taxes in countries in which they work. This is a form of corruption that hurts the poor. More equitable taxation could easily eclipse official development assistance received by countries. At so many of the recent meetings I've been to, developing countries have been clear in their strong desire 
to improve their domestic resource mobilization and take important steps forward toward greater self-sufficiency, which in turn will allow them to offer more services to their citizens. Efforts to boost shared prosperity will differ in each country. A low-income country may need to ramp up agricultural productivity. Middle-income countries may focus more on urbanization, building safe, clean, livable cities. For a country where most children don't go to school, to primary school, this has to be the first goal that is achieved. But for every country, we're doing everything we can to help our clients stimulate inclusive economic growth. And when growth is slowing, this is the time we have to focus even more on our uh, efforts to do the second two things, invest and insure. Investing in health and education, as we now know, promotes economic growth. Furthermore, social protection programs have been shown to stimulate local economies as well as shield the disadvantaged from falling back into poverty. In Latin America, where we'll hold our annual meetings uh, next week in Lima, Peru, there are several programs that beautifully combine elements of the Grow, Invest, Insure strategy. Latin America was one of the most unequal regions in the world throughout the second half of the 20th century. But in the 21st century, it's become markedly less so. Growth in these countries led to higher hourly wages, and governments adopted a number of policies that have had real staying power. Enforcement of labor contracts and a minimum wage, greater access to schools, progressive educational spending that favors the poor, pensions, and above all, conditional cash transfers, for which there's abundant evidence that giving cash rather than regressive subsidies for fuel or food produces lasting positive effects. Peru's uh, Programa Juntos, which began in 2005, has reached half a million poor families with conditional cash transfers worth $38 each month based on regular health and nutrition checkups for young children. Uh, Brazil's Bolsa Familia benefited 14 million families and helped cut poverty by 28% in the last decade at a cost of only 0.5% of GDP. Oportunidades in Mexico, now called Prospera, is a conditional cash transfer program where one quarter of recipients' income was saved and reinvested in productive small business or self-employment ventures. Throughout the hemisphere, 15% of the fall in inequality was attributable to these progressive social protection transfers. No matter the level of prospects for economic growth, we have to increase our efforts to ensure poor people against the risks and looming disasters of modern life. Well-off people already benefit from various forms of insurance, but everyone should have a safety net. Too many people are living just one illness or accident away from destitution, even in a rich country like the United States. We've also learned over the years that investing in people, especially in their health and education, is one of the most critical actions countries can take to promote economic growth. Two weeks ago, 267 of the world's leading economists, organized by Larry Summers, a group that included Kaushik Basu, our chief economist, and several of our colleagues at the World Bank, signed an appeal in The Lancet for governments to invest in what they call a pro-poor pathway to universal health care. In their declaration, they state that over the past decade, health improvements have accounted for fully 24% of full income growth in low-income and middle-income countries. The economic benefits of universal health care are 10 times the cost, and it's a mission on which over 100 countries are now well underway. One of our most cherished and broadly shared values is the notion of equality of opportunity. In our quest to achieve equality of opportunity for all, we will have to invest in health care that will lead to what Larry Summers has called the grand convergence in health outcomes. Only when everyone in the world can expect to receive health care and be healthy can we really seriously talk about equality of opportunity. Now, among the investments in people we need to make, the most important one, in my view, starts when a woman becomes pregnant. It's the combination of health and education, 
of investment and insurance, known as early childhood development uh, interventions. 26% of all children under five in developing countries are stunted, a condition in which children are not only malnourished and understimulated, but risk a loss of cognitive abilities that lasts a lifetime. In sub-Saharan Africa, some 36% of children are stunted. That's nearly four in 10 of sub-Saharan Africa's children with limited prospects in life. This is a disgrace, a global scandal, and in my view, a medical emergency. When an infant brain is not fully developed, whether from malnutrition, toxic stress, or a lack of stimulation, the neural connections actually just don't form. Once a child loses those neural connections, the damage is permanent to, area, uh, to areas of the brain, and this is what's most troubling, to the areas of the brain involved in learning, emotions, and future responses to stress. An impaired prefrontal cortex affects the emergence of a young child's self-regulatory skills, uh, cascading in a short time to serious problems for their executive function, working memory, and adaptability to change. What does this have to do with shared prosperity? Everything. Children who are stunted by age five will not have an equal opportunity in life. There can be no equality of opportunity without proper antenatal care for mothers or the appropriate stimulation, nurturing, and nutrition for infants and young children. Conditions of poverty, toxic stress, as in situations of conflict, will have, will have produced such damage that these children may never be able to make the best of any future opportunities. If your brain won't let you learn and adapt in a fast-changing world, you won't prosper and neither will society. All of us lose. At the World Bank Group, we're committed to effective action on early childhood development. We've identified five packages of 25 services for families with young children, all based on strong evidence. From 2001 to 2013, we invested $3.3 billion in early childhood development programs around the world, in Haiti, in Indonesia, in Jamaica, Lesotho, Mozambique, Russia, and Vietnam. More programs in more countries are in the works, but we must do even more. Every country has to invest. What we need now is an ambitious goal that will help drive our work in early childhood development. For childhood stunting, there is, in fact, a goal set in 2012, a global target to reduce stunting in children by 40% by 2025. But that would still leave 100 million children stunted, and that's not ambitious enough. With strong leadership from UNICEF, the World Health Organization, from new partners, such as the world's number one men's tennis player, Novak Djokovic, whose foundation is working with us and the Serbian government to improve early childhood development programs, we must aim higher. If equality of opportunity is a value that we indeed all share, and we're serious about boosting shared prosperity, we need to work together to set a target to end stunting for all children as quickly as possible and well before 2030. But we shouldn't stop there. Even before primary school, all children should have access to preschool. In New York last week, I met with President Santos of Colombia, who had just signed a peace agreement that could bring an end to the last remaining conflict in Latin America. Even in the face of conflict, President Santos has moved aggressively to increase access to preschool and ECD uh, interventions, knowing that it's not a luxury of peacetime. This is the kind of leadership we need. Preschool is another great investment. Every dollar spent closing the gap in pre-primary education between the well-off and the poor will return between six and $17. For shared prosperity to endure so that people, once having lifted themselves from poverty, aren't plunged back into it, we have to rethink our role in an unstable world riven by conflict, crisis, pandemics, and climate change. Who is most at risk during times of crisis? Poor people. Last year, Ebola struck three of the world's poorest countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. The months of global inaction to fight the epidemic and the deaths of more than 11,000 people can be directly tied to the poverty of those countries. Many of those who died were among the extreme poor, whereas the survival rate among Americans, thank God, who contracted the virus was 100 percent. 
We must not do now as we've always done before. Panic while the crisis rages, neglect when the headlines fade. The World Bank Group will not forget the lessons of Ebola. We're now working on a global pandemic facility that will effectively provide insurance to poor countries for whenever the next pandemic hits. To prevent the outbreak from reaching pandemic proportions, remember, outbreaks are a certainty, pandemics are a choice. The facility would rapidly release funds for trained personnel to respond immediately. Disbursements of up to hundreds of millions of dollars will support first responders. If they can stop the epidemic quickly, they will save many, many lives and prevent enormous economic losses. The facility will be a critical part of a larger pandemic response capacity we're currently building that we hope will finally, finally be equal to the challenge. If a flu outbreak like the one that killed millions of people in 1918 happened today, tens of millions of lives uh, uh, would be lost and the cost to the world would be somewhere between 5 to 10 percent of global GDP. That's 4 to 8 trillion dollars. But today, we're not ready to stop such a pandemic. And as with all natural disasters, it's the poor who will suffer the most. In difficult times, when we're concerned about growing inequality, worried about the health of our planet and future pandemics, and outraged that one quarter of all children in developing countries are stunted, we must tackle the biggest problems with only the highest aspirations. Only then will, be, will we be successful. I've said it many times, when you're fighting extreme poverty, optimism is a moral choice. Pessimism in the face of extreme poverty can become a self-fulfilling prophecy that will surely be deadly for the poor. Our goals of ending extreme poverty by 2030 and boosting shared prosperity are not just slogans. We're serious about them and we have a plan. Grow, invest, ensure. This plan starts with a pregnant woman who lives in a conflict zone. We must do whatever it takes to support her so that her newborn child will have a world of opportunity equal to that of any child in the world. Bringing the rate of stunting down to zero will be an enormous task but if we're serious about shared prosperity, it is, in fact, our task, our shared responsibility. Now is the time to get serious. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, you have given us a lot to think about here. And, um, I, I'd like to uh, invite everyone in our audience uh, to join us for this question and answer period. We will be taking your questions, and for those who are following us uh, online, uh, you can send in your questions as well. And please join us on Twitter with hashtag bottom40. Hashtag bottom40 um, for the social media Great. mavens among us. Um, so. You know, you, you highlighted a very ambitious and inspiring agenda. I mentioned in, in the introduction, you know, I'm delighted that the new uh, Sustainable Development Goals include Goal 16, mm -hmm. which talks about the importance of inclusive, accountable, participatory government, justice for all. How, how does the World Bank view that goal in light of the agenda that you've laid out and as a part of the uh, the three, the three big approaches you've outlined. Yeah. Well, you know, we um, uh, we know that um, the governments that will be successful in reaching goals or getting programs done, it's pretty predictable. The places that have good governance, that have uh, well-running um, uh, institutions, uh, uh, well uh, well-funded and established institutions, will always do better. So we a we absolutely know that governance and rule of law are critical. The question for us at the bank has been, well, so how do, you, how do you actually help governments improve their governance? And elected officials come into office and, uh, you know, they're not born with a sense of how to make a governmental bureaucracy work more effectively. So we've tried to work with partners to get very concrete about how to help improving governance, how to help uh, improving rule of law. Like, you know, the taxation issue I talked about. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's really stunning what could happen if, uh, if governments just got better at, uh, at, at collecting taxes in a, in, a, in a fair way. Some have suggested this could be two to three times of official development assistance. 
And yeah. a lot of it is just that the institutions don't work. So um, uh, I think that uh, now uh, with Goal 16, we've got to take the next step and say, well, who's concerned about this? Who are the partners we can work with? How can we go forward together and actually hold ourselves accountable for real improvements? I mean, there are some governments that, uh, that it will be very difficult to work with. I have to tell you, I found that across the board, uh, especially new leaders, especially young leaders, they come in and they want to do better, but the, the question they have is, so, so what should we do differently by next Tuesday that will allow us to actually do better? We have to get better at providing that kind of support and we have to get better at, uh, at working together you know, with, the, with the right partners. This is what we're trying to do in every sort of major issue we go forward on. Who are the partners? How serious are we? Can we really work together to take the agenda forward um, uh, quickly and effectively? And you don't get pushback when you say the word tax? I no. notice. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, we, call, well, we call it domestic resource mobilization, yeah. right? Great but, uh, term. Great term. We're we going to hear that on the campaign yeah. trail. <laughs> but we know, what, we know what it means, right? Yeah. We know what yeah, it yeah, means. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and the basic reality is that so many uh, tax systems in developing countries uh, are, are incredibly regressive. That's, that it's the poor people who have to pay every time they slaughter a goat. And you know the richest families pay nothing, right? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, uh, transparency around that particular aspect of tax systems in poor countries. I think we just have to. We, I think we. Think, I think we have to be transparent about it, and we have to ask their peop the people of those countries. We have to ask the leaders: Is this something that you think is reasonable? Because it's being asked now in donor countries. They're saying, you know, it, why should we provide support if they won't even collect the taxes in their own country? Right. Um, some countries collect a very small percentage of GDP with their taxes, and they know they've got to get better. We want to help. And, you know, it's partly a political problem, but to the extent that it's a practical problem where they just don't know how to take next steps, you know, both the, you know, along with the IMF, we've got to be in every single country and provide as much support as we can. Um, you, you know, you, you spoke very movingly about um, what happens to children under five in terms of brain development, um, both from malnutrition, which I think there's been deeper study on, but also these other toxic right. shocks and the impact of conflict that you really can't recover from. And um, that, uh, that's something that I don't think is, is really understood and maybe could change some of the choices leaders make as countries are plunged into violence or conflict. How, how, how do you see the bank moving forward on that? Because that, that, that's fundamental and powerful uh, information. Well, you, you know, I, I'm very pleased that we're talking about inequality so much more, right? So, you know, in uh, beautiful mountain retreats and, you know, uh, meetings in Aspen, et cetera, we talk about it now and we talk about it more than before. Uh, but there's no way that you can say we're making uh, progress on inequality if fully a quarter of all children in developing countries are losing neural connections. 700 to 1,000 neural connections are made every second. And if there are high levels of cortisol circulating, the stress hormone circulating in people's bodies, those connections don't get made. Also, simple things like the nu nutrition is a big part of it, but um, the, the interaction between parents and children. You know, uh, babies are born in the world as learning machines. They're, they're, they're focused on learning. And every time they make a sound or babble, every, they, they're looking for a response from the parents. And if the parents don't give that to them, they literally get stressed because that's what they're looking for. Right? We did this incredible study over 22 years. Uh, we, were, we were involved in it in, in Jamaica, where um, we took stunted children and gave them all different kinds of interventions. And the one intervention that had the biggest impact was when we sent young people to encourage mothers to interact with their children. They did it every week for two years. In that group that got that intervention, their income 22 years later was equivalent to those of non-stunted children. Everyone else was at least 25% less. And these other children were getting the nutritional uh, supplements. So we now know so wow. much more about that kind of interaction, but we also know a lot more about toxic stress. So in situations of conflict, uh, if there's a constant conflict and there's no way to, uh, um, uh, uh, to alleviate it through warm relationships or at least the stopping of the conflict, what happens is the expression of your genetic material actually changes. This, this is an epigenetic change that actually happens in your, in your brain. And again, you cannot recover after a certain time. So 
the point I'm making here, I, and I, I'm not just being a medical doctor in a development institution. What I'm saying is, if you're serious about boosting shared prosperity, you've got to get to when inequality begins. Inequality begins with a pregnant mother. Inequality especially begins with a pregnant mother in a conflict situation. And, you know, show your seriousness. You know, if you just want to talk about these things at mountain retreats, that's one thing. But if you're serious about attacking it, we cannot have 26% of children in the world literally handicapped at the age of five and have any uh, sense of uh, 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 that we're serious about tackling this issue of inequality. That's where it starts, and we've got to make rapid progress. We're, you know, we see also from the perspective of, of peace builders that it's very difficult to build peace in a country <coughs> that has multi-generational conflict yeah. where that percentage of toxic stress is, is probably even higher, and I'm not sure we have good data mm -hmm. on that. Just something well, so, that would be good to work you with know, you Something on. that we were talking about earlier, but um, uh, you know, one of the things that, um, <laughs> that we've just had to recognize is that um, our approach to, to linking development and, um, and, and humanitarian response to peace building processes has just been terrible. We haven't done it well. And generally speaking, we've thought that development is something that happens after the humanitarian crisis and after peace treaties are, are signed, as opposed to something that has to happen at the same time. Amen. So, you know, <laughs> uh, the fundamental reala realization is that refugees are refugees for an average of 17 years now. Yeah. So this is, these are not short-term problems. And so we're trying to truly fundamentally rethink how we uh, help uh, countries in conflict reestablish the social contract. We're trying to think completely differently about refugees. What, can we help refugees start businesses? Can we uh, uh, upgrade dramatically the quality of education for refugees? Uh, can we think differently about um, uh, states? Right? So Lebanon has a, and, and, and Jordan has a huge percentage of their own population uh, uh, that is now uh, coming from other countries, refugees. What do we do about that? Do we just sit back and say, languish for 17 years? You know, we've just had some great conversations with uh, leaders in, uh, uh, at the UN General Assembly where we're saying, we have to rethink this fundamentally. You know, can we uh, take some lessons? Like, for example, uh, we now know that in Turkey last year, that has done it very differently. They've just sort of let all the Syrians come in and they're integrating into the society. 26% of all new businesses last year in Turkey were started by Syrian refugees. And in the areas where the most Syrian refugees have settled, economic growth has been faster than in other parts of Turkey. You take it a step further. Um, uh, you know, you look at a lot of the uh, advanced economies, and we're just putting out a report on demographics that looks at this. In advanced economies, the elderly population is increasing, the working population is shrinking, uh, birth, uh, the birth rate is declining. So the strategy for those countries is to welcome immigrants. Right? Or should and be. It should be. Uh, well, the economic strategy we're saying is that's the way it should be. Now, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an economic migrant, right? So, you know, we are an uh, economic refugee. We came from Korea in 1964 when Korea was an extremely poor country looking for opportunities. And I have to tell you, at first, I didn't really feel like, you know, I was going to be welcomed as an American. Uh, you know, I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and in Iowa. Um, uh, many people had never seen an Asian person before. So it didn't really feel like I was, you know, going to be integrated into society. But over time, things have changed. And it's been part of the American growth strategy to welcome immigrants and, and let them become hyphenated Americans. And so I've, you know, I've issued a challenge to, to my, uh, my friends in Korea. When will we see uh, the emergence of Syrian Koreans right, who feel that they're part of, uh, of Korea? Well, Korea has a huge problem in terms of a shrinking workforce and a, and a, and a, and a reducing uh, birth rate for economic growth. That's my story. I'm sticking with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's Let, let's open it up for questions. Um, if uh, we can bring the mics, let's start with, we'll start with Lindsay, I see over there. And we'll take a couple. Good morning, I'm Lindsay Coates from Interaction. Thank you so much for the very inspiring Hi, remarks. Yeah. Um, I have a question though that's a little sticky. So I'm a big fan of um, SDG 16. I think it's terrific. I also think domestic resource mobilization is, is critical, so I'm glad to hear your remarks on that. The, the problem I see and the question I have is what is the World Bank 
group's appropriate role in the political problem of those domestic resources actually going toward human well-being. Because, you know, we fight in this country about funding for Head Start, and we don't fight as much about funding for bombs. You know, Lindsay, at the end of the day, ultimately, you know, um, uh, 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 nation states have to make their own decisions about how they utilize domestic resources. But what we can provide is uh, overwhelming evidence that investing in your people is the most important thing for you to do. Right? So, um, I, you know, and this is relatively new. So I, I just, you know, I, I can't tell you how incredibly grateful we are to Larry Summers for having done this now for about a couple of years, right? He said that, you know, um, uh, if, you, if you don't invest in healthcare, you either can't count or you don't care. Because the, the numbers are very direct, right? We, 20 years ago, as you know, Lindsay, 20 years ago, I was part of the 50 Years is Enough movement to try to close down the World Bank Group. And part of it was because, um, <laughs> Part of it was because we didn't think, we think the World Bank Group, we thought at that time, and this is why I gave the speech I did today, was too focused on just GDP growth. But, and, and, you know, to be fair, 20 years ago, we just did not have the evidence of the direct connection between investments in health and education and economic growth. Now, it seems like a no-brainer, but it's still very hard to get finance ministers to make that choice when they've got critical infrastructure to build, when uh, they have to provide more energy for their people. Uh, we need to get more effective at making the economic case and celebrating when they do the right thing about investing in people. Right? You cannot go into the world with a quarter of your future working population stunted and think you're going to be able to compete. You know, so many things are changing. Will the path to economic development and industrialization even include manufacturing uh, in the next uh, you know, couple of decades? Well, you know, robotics and you know, 3D printers, and will that take over all of manufacturing? Well, if that does happen, then the one thing that you're going to need above anything else, you're going to need healthy people who are able to learn and adapt to new uh, economic circumstances. And so we, we are making that argument very strongly. That's why I gave this speech. That's what we're going to keep saying. It is no longer sort of uh, investing in people is no longer something you do after you've done everything else in your budget. This is part of your growth strategy, and it's what you leave uh, for, uh, for your children and future generations. And without it, you're not going to be able to compete in the future. Healthy people able to learn and able to manage conflict. Able to manage, well. So violence doesn't absolutely. undercut all your development it, it, goals. It's, it's, and it's everything. <laughs> this, is, this is why we're so fundamentally trying to rethink what we do. We've just, you know, we have to just admit it's not worked. Whatever we've tried to do has not worked. And so now the question is, uh, can much more aggressive efforts at economic development, at job creation, at better, edu uh, at, uh, at better education in conflict zones, is that something we can do quickly? And is that something that we can do that will actually have an impact on the conflict? We don't know, but we're going to try. Right. right, and the, you know, as they say, never waste a crisis. And so what we're, the, the hope is that the Syrian refugee crisis will really push us into new creative important ways of Yeah, and we're already seeing it. Ahead. We're yeah. already seeing it, Nancy. We're already seeing the conversation has shifted. And at the UN General Assembly, the conversation was fundamentally different. People were really trying to look for um, uh, you know, different ways of, uh, of approaching it. And, and we, we, we hope to have some announcements soon about what we're going to do. Um, I, before we go back to the audience, uh, we have uh, a question from uh, Kashif Ali in Islamabad. So you have a far-ranging audience wow. today. Um, who asks, in most developing countries, the economy is based on agriculture and taxation that hurts the poor farmer the most. How do you improve that system? That, that's, a, that's exactly right, because taxation systems, I mean, I've seen this in many places I've worked, where, you know, peasant farmers that we've worked with have to pay a fee every time they, they slaughter a goat. And then um, in, some, in, in, in one country uh, that I've worked in, uh, there is a list of 10,000 or so, I, I don't know the exact number, wealthy people who are by law exempt from paying taxes. This just makes no sense. It's the ultimate um, uh, regressive tax system and they're everywhere. And so what we're hearing is that there is new courage and uh, new conviction to change that situation. And so this is why Christine uh, Lagarde and I just jumped right on top of this and said, okay, what can we do? Can we set a target? for increased domestic resource mobilization? Can we set a target for making uh, uh, tax systems fairer and uh, 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 more, more progressive? 
Uh, I hope so. We'll, we, we'll see. I mean, that's what the countries want. They want their own resources to be able to manage their own development uh, process going forward. We will keep, as, uh, as Lindsay mentioned, we will keep uh, uh, stressing that investing in people is the most important thing. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this could really mark a, a new period uh, in, uh, in development. Great. We have a questioner over here. My, my name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation and a wonderful forum. I think if you, uh, I mean World Bank or, or United Nations, if you can really do something about liberty and justice, the problem now, also everything we are talking about, whether democracy, freedom, accountability, whatever, they seems all right. Even now we have the internet, all the high tech, they are being used to obstruct or unjust manipulation of people's activities. So I just wonder if you can really do this effort. Thank you. We're going to take a couple of questions, so if you can Great. store that. Is there uh, someone over, on, over here, right here? And then if you can st stage up for this gentleman there. Hi, how are you? My uh, name is Aran Sasu. I'm Peruvian and I go to school at Cornell. And looking at the situation in Peru and in Mary Latin American countries, and hearing what you said about uh, this is SDG 16, I definitely agree that uh, a re taxation reform is very important. But how do you deal with that when corruption is so ingrained in the system that that's a heavy reason why there's no taxation reform, why there's no um, investment in education, in healthcare? because corruption is such a heavy problem and every um, hopeful and optimist politician that enters the political um, spectrum in, in institutions is met with many politicians that are already corrupt and there's no way that they can possibly work around the system when they're being threatened for their life or yeah. um, just enter this very Great. ingrained system of corruption. Okay, thank, thank you. you. We're going to take one more gentleman right here. Hi, Richard Wanneman, Public International Law and Policy Group. Going back to your talk about refugees and post-conflict, um, now that increasingly more ceasefires and permanent peace agreements are including economic development or at least reparations, payments of some kind, do you, in light of all of these comments about investing in refugee communities or refugee economies, do you see more of a technical role for the World Bank to play a part in negotiate or giving technical assistance to these ceasefire negotiations, whether in Colombia or elsewhere, um, as we see more of them globally, predominantly in lower income countries. So data sets that people don't have confidence in, corruption and corrupt politicians, yeah. all the, all yeah, the yeah. good challenges, right. <laughs> and peace so, agreements. So um, I think there's a broad recognition that we need much better data. And um, it's something that the Gates Foundation has has really gone after, and it's something that the U.S. government, I mean, uh, President Obama has made it clear that this is going to be a huge priority for him to include better, to collect better data around everything that's happening in development, and, and, and for us as well. I mean, we're really thinking hard about how much more do we need to invest in getting better data going forward, and the conclusion really has been that there's almost, it's almost impossible to invest too much in getting better data. It's for a lot of different reasons. First of all, just the truth-telling part of it, but also having data will help us to shape our activities. You don't know if you're uh, getting better unless you have better data. So I, I really hope that what you're going to see over the next few years is a revolution in how we think about data collection. It's going to become very, very important. On corruption, so um, thank you very much, uh, my friend, the uh, peruana. Um, you know, I've been, I've been working in Peru for you now, starting in 1994, so you know, more than two decades. In 1994, the very first project we, we did in a squatter settlement, are you from Lima? Yeah. So where we started was Caraballo, right? When you were born, Caraballo was a bedroom community for Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path. And uh, there was nothing there. And we built a little pharmacy, a little rotating pharmacy next to the church. And on New Year's Eve 1994, they blew it up. And they said that, this was, that they were representatives of the Shining Path, and they wanted to stop these little projects that were deceiving the people and delaying the revolution, okay? So that was my start in, uh, in Lima. We had to drive about 30 minutes into Independencia to use the one phone line that was available, right? And inequality was, was off the charts. 
uh, there were, had been bouts of hyperinflation where people in Caraballo, when they got their paycheck, would spend every penny of it buying things at the first of the month because they knew that the value of the money that they got the first of the month would be devalued um, tremendously by the end of the month, right? So uh, monetary policy was a mess, uh, and, you know, conflict was, was rife, inequality was enormous, huge numbers of people living in poverty. Since then, Peru has been an incredible success story. High rates of economic growth, the number of people living in extreme poverty have been halved, the incomes of the bottom uh, 40 percent have grown faster than the overall incomes during all these years, and amazingly stunting was brought from 28 percent to 14 percent in a short period of time. Now, you know, um, I, I, it, it's all part of what's been happening that's so positive in Latin America, a real focus on equality, a real focus on uh, access to services. Right? So all of that happened in a context where, yes, there was corruption. Right? So what I hear f so often is people say, oh, there's all this corruption. And you're right. Everyone who says there's all this corruption is right. But there's corruption here, too. There's corruption everywhere. Corruption is sort of part of the human condition. Uh, the most important thing is that you never use corruption as an excuse not to focus on the task, which is, for us, any extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. We work in situations where there's corruption. And every time we see it, we call it out. So over the last 20 years, there's less corruption in our projects, still corruption around our projects, but that, that doesn't mean we stop uh, because we're judging the corruption. We can't stop because there are still poor people in those countries. So the best thing you can do is continue to go at it and know that even in settings where there is corruption, you can make a lot of progress. Yeah. Uh, and the other one was, yes, role. You know, we, it's written into our articles of agreement that we can't be involved in the internal politics of a country. So we probably won't be involved in negotiations, but, for example, um, if we uh, can uh, link uh, peace agreements to uh, funding, and, 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 and we, didn't do it, uh, we didn't do it officially, but here's what we've been doing. The Secretary General and I, of uh, the United Nations and I, have been traveling together. And we went, when we went to the Great Lakes region, he went, and, and at the same time, he signed an 11-state um, agreement on a peace process. And we put on the table about a billion and a half dollars for regional integration that would improve trade. That, you, know, you know, amazing, in these countries, the trade barriers are enormous. There's like 50 stops you need to make to go from one country to another between the DRC and Uganda, for example. Right? So we, we, were, we put money on the table for regional uh, initiatives that would great, greatly improve uh, uh, the uh, economy of the region, but it was clear if not official, it was clear that this would only go forward if they stuck with the peace agreement. Right? This is what we're trying to do now. Go in and negotiate the peace while at the same time going in at, uh, with, with, uh, with the UN and trying to see if we can link development uh, uh, projects that would make people more likely to stick with the peace agreements. That, that's what we need to do. It's been, it, you know, it, <clears throat> when, uh, when we arrived um, in, uh, in the Great Lakes, the first trip that the Secretary General and I ever took, he looked at me and he said, you know, uh, we've looked. This is the first trip that the President of the World Bank and the Sec UN Secretary General have ever made together. So it was the first, I mean, and 70 years ago, it was the intention of the founders of these two institutions that we would work very closely together. The first time in history that they'd, we'd ever traveled on the same mission together. So we've done three, we're going to do more, and we hope to continue it because, uh, you know, the, uh, things like uh, organizational identity, which is what stopped this from happening before, raising the flag or whatever, has, is what stopped it. And how ridiculous is that in the face of the conflicts we face? Thank you. Hashtag bottom 40. A uh, couple more. We can take two more questions. So let's go in the... Okay. Well, can we take one from Nico? Nico Mombriol from Oxfam. I quoted you guys, so let, let's, yeah. let, let's give Nico a chance. Nico, stand up so we know uh -huh. who you are. There you go. Yeah. Go hey, ahead. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Nicolas Mombri. I'm the head of the Oxfam International Office in DC. So yeah, the first thing I wanted to say is thank you, Jim, for you know, pointing out the problem of increasing income inequality and using our report. We have another quote that I think was also a lot in the news, you know, is that the one person richest people will have as much wealth as the rest of us next year. So it shows you how, you know, how big the issue is. Also, thanks for speaking so strongly against trickle-down economics. I can tell you how long we've been waiting to hear the World Bank say that <laughs> and the IMF like two months ago. 
Um, you rightly pointed out to the problem of companies uh, not paying the taxes and using strategies not to do that in the poorest countries. Next week in Lima, there will be a meeting of the finance ministers on the OECD BEPS process. Uh, Jim, you can probably explain it better than me, but it's like a, a process at the OECD trying to solve this issue. There's been a lot of criticism from our side and many other CSOs about this process saying, you know, yes, it brings solution, but A, that was not inclusive. There was only about three rich countries. B, it's not covering a lot of issues that are important for them. I wanted to know what's your point of view on that and what can you do and what can you do with Christine Lagarde? Mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead and Sure, yeah, take that? Nico, you know, we, this is it's a, it's a great point and uh, we've talked about this and I think, you know, um, uh, the, the BEPS, which is base erosion and profit shifting, which really looks at the way that companies uh, use things like transfer pricing, you know, taking all the profits in one country, whereas, in fact, a lot of the work was done in another country, and, and essentially minimizing their taxes by utilizing the, their, their, their multinational status. These kinds of things, first of all, let me just say, I think it's really important that OECD and Angel Guria has taken this on. It's a really important first step. And I think, you know, the, uh, the, the, especially the the commentary that you've made about we've got to now extend this and include um, uh, what's happening in developing countries. For me personally, I think that's a very valid, um, uh, uh, you know, part critique, but part a sense of where the the, st the process has to go next. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I, I, next time I talk to Angel, uh, we'll, we will talk about this, and I think it's a it's a really good next step to really see how you know uh, becoming a multinational corporation. If you can just sort of take your profits in the places that have the lowest taxes, it just doesn't seem fair. And this is what uh, everyone's talking about. So domestic resource mobilization, as many of you know, we've, we, uh, we put together a document with the other multilateral development banks and IMF called Billions to Trillions, increasing the amount available for the sustainable development goals. Domestic resource mobilization is one of them, but the developing countries have been very clear about this. They call it uh, the illicit financial flows. And in, included in illicit financial flows, in addition to, you know, to individuals just stealing money and, and taking it out, uh, uh, you know, and, and for that, what they need is cooperation from banks in, in, uh, in the developed countries to not hide those, uh, those large transfers. But what they also talk about is corporations that don't pay any taxes in their country, despite the fact that, for example, they may extract minerals from those countries. And so uh, this is now firmly on the agenda. Illicit, stopping illicit, illicit financial flows is firmly on the agenda and could very well be the next step of, uh, of what the uh, OECD does. Um, two quick questions, Kathleen and then Alex. Good morning, Kathleen Keenest, uh, USIP and formerly at the World Bank. Uh, my question today is on the SDG number five, gender equality. Uh, I would be interested in uh, what your recent data is saying about this important SDG and what you at the World Bank um, are doing with regards to gender equality. Okay, and then let's just get from Alex. And Hi, Alex Thier from USAID. Great to see both of you. I'm proudly carrying my Goal 16 phone, iPhone cover. <laughs> uh, and, I, and I wanted to go back to, to Goal 16 because, as you know, going through the Addis Accord and financing for development and now these sustainable development goals, the toughest part of our shared mission to end extreme poverty is going to be about dealing with the challenge in fragile and failed states. Yeah. And one of the things that that challenges us to do is to figure out not only how we use more of the public resources, but also how we get other actors, private sector and others, in two fragile states. But there's a, a lot of risk involved in that. And so we have to be creative about how we're going to do more to promote inclusive growth even in those hardest to reach places. And I wonder if you can say more about what you're doing to achieve that. Right. So on the issue of, uh, of gender equality, you know, there, there's hardly any more no-brainer than things like, you know, uh, focusing on education for girls. Um, you know, the other, the other great thing, you know, I don't mean to pick on Korea, uh, but let me pick on Korea for a second, right? So, um, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, in order for them to succeed, they're going to have to really be a destination of choice for skilled workers from other countries who feel that they're going to become part of Korea. So they've got to get over, if you will, racism, right? Uh, the other thing they have to get over is sexism because it's the, it's the lowest female participation uh, uh, in the labor force of any OECD country. Mm -hmm. So they've got to take steps 
of getting past sexism in the workforce, right? So I, I, I think we can say very clearly that if you want to compete economically, you have got to focus on gender equality and bringing you know, education for girls, opportunities for girls, uh, uh, and opportunities for women to participate in the workforce. This is not easy. So, you know, Japan, for example, has made a declaration that they're going to do this, but they have to change the fabric of society. Daycare centers have to change. Lots of things have to change. But uh, again, we just feel so good that we can say uh, that economic growth is about gender equality. It really is about gender equality. And I think that's going to be our most important role. Our most important role is going to be to continue to emphasize that we're not saying this uh, just because it's the right thing to do, which it is. We're saying this because you're going to have to compete, and you can't if you, leave, uh, uh, if you don't educate girls and you don't give opportunities for women. So we, as you know, we have a cross-cutting solutions area. Karen Ground, uh, who's worked at USAID, is now leading the effort. We have to do better. We have to uh, um, uh, you know, uh, do a lot more for gender equality in places where talking about gender equality is tough, but, but we'll do it. Um, Alex, you know, um, uh, this is something that uh, you said A AID, right? You've, yeah. This is something we're going to have to work a lot on together because, look, uh, ending extreme poverty by 2030, half of all people living in extreme poverty will be living in fragile and conflict affected states by 2020. So um, uh, we are really rethinking what we do. We know that we have to really move a lot of our investments into fragility and conflict. We know that we have to, it's not just about sort of basic services, it's about uh, stimulating the private sector. I mean, you, you cannot sort of leave things to later in these settings. So it's our biggest challenge, uh, and yet it's our central challenge. Unless we're better at, uh, at, uh, um, uh, at uh, working in fragile and conflict-affected states, you know, forget any possibility of reaching the end of, uh, end of extreme poverty goal. Absolutely. So um, a final question for you to bring it home on is um, from Zubida Nanfuka, excuse me if I mispronounced it, Virginia, who says, what do you say to the cynics who think that shared prosperity is an illusion? Yeah. Well, um, what I say to the cynics is what um, my good friend uh, um, uh, Tracy Cower, uh, excuse me, Tracy, um, Tracy Kidder, who wrote a book about my, um, my, my close friend and colleague Paul Farmer, said, um, he, he, you know, he followed us around. We were in the prisons of Siberia together. We were in Haiti, uh, central Haiti. We were in the slums of Lima together. And he, he just couldn't believe how optimistic we, we were all the time, right? And he was a writer. And he said, you know, I just looked at you guys and I thought you were so naive to be so optimistic all the time until I realized that cynicism is the last refuge of the coward. And with that, please well, join me in thanking Dr. Jim Kim. Great end. Thank you, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain in your seats until the official party departs.